On and off the screen, Clint Walker and Jack Elam had a special bond. They were more than just co-stars, they were close friends because they had worked together in Western Favorites. Still, when Jack Elam died in 2003, fans were shocked that Clint didn't show up to his funeral. This made many people wonder why. In what way could Clint not have said goodbye to the person he loved so much? Let's start by talking about Clint Walker and why his friendship with Jack Elam changed in a way that no one saw coming. Jack Elam was born in Arizona in 1920 in a small mining town called Miami. It is a place about 85 miles from Phoenix that you may not have heard of. Miller, his dad, did a lot of different jobs. As well as being a mill worker, he was also a builder. The Elam family didn't have an easy life. A close town called Globe, Arizona was their new home by the time Jack was four years old. Soon after, tragedy struck the family. Lucy Amelia, Jack's mother, died in 1924, when Jack was only four years old. What caused it? Back then, they called it general paralysis. It's more likely that she had something much worse wrong with her. A sickness that had been bothering her for three long years. That's a really young age to lose your mother to something so terrible. Jack and Mildred, his bigger sister, were without their mom. Jack and his sister moved around and lived with different family members after Alice died. None of them had an easy time. Then, when Jack was eight years old, his dad got married again in 1928. Kansas is where his new wife, Flossie Varney, came from because Flossie taught in a public school, their lives were getting a little more stable. In 1930, Flossie's mother and the rest of her family were living together in Globe. Things seemed to be getting better after Millard got a job as a detective for a loan company. Even Jack, who was only a child at the time, helped out by picking cotton on nearby fields whenever he could. But Jack still had more ups and downs to deal with in life. There was a big fight between Jack and another boy when he was only 11 years old in 1931. Jack's left eye was poked with a pencil at the end of this one. Could you picture? He loses one eye in a fight at a Boy Scout meeting of all places. That kind of wound doesn't just get better on its own. Even though they tried to help, the damage was already done. In the end, they had to take out the lens from his left eye, which made it forever blind. In the end, Jack said that it began to drift. That's how you get that famous cocky look. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. If you've seen Jack Elam in a movie or TV show, you know that I became what made him famous. He had a look on his face that you would never forget. In those early days, though, it was just bad luck for a kid. After the fact, Jack would joke about it, saying, I lost my eye when I was 11 in a fight at, you wouldn't believe it, a Boy Scout meeting, but I got into a fight with another kid, and he stuck a pencil through my eye. It was a big honor night. There was no doctor nearby right away. His eye wasn't getting the right care for a while. It was too late for them to do anything. It took Jack about 20 years for his eye to start moving around. In 1951, Jack was working on the movie Rawhide. He told Daryl Zanuck, who was in charge of 20th Century Fox, that he could fix the eye, but Zanuck told him not to. He told her it was part of your charm. What do you know? Zanuck was right. People will always remember Jack Elam as an actor because of that lazy eye. However, let's not act like it didn't also bother him. Jack said that because of the eye, he was sometimes a little off-center when he talked to people, but it was just a part of who he was at that point. Let's take a break from talking about cocky actors and talk about Jack's life before he thought about being in movies. He didn't always want to be in Hollywood, after all. He first had some pretty normal jobs. When he was done with high school, he went to California from Arizona. He got married there and then went to college to study business. He wasn't just thinking about school at that time, though. Jack had many jobs. He sold things, worked as an accountant for Standard Oil, kept books at Bank of America, and even ran the Los Angeles Hotel Bel Air. For someone like Jack, that last job is pretty cool. After that, Jack joined the service during World War II, like many other men his age. He served for two years in the U.S. Navy. Even though he was blind in one eye, that's pretty amazing. Jack went back to work in business after the war. He worked for companies like Samuel Goldwyn Productions and even Hopalong Cassidy Productions as an independent inspector and became well-known in Hollywood. He was basically the person who kept the books for very wealthy movie moguls. But this is where life threw him another curveball. It hurt his good eye too much to read and check all those financial papers for so long. It was the only one he could see out of. He once told a reporter that his good eye kept closing. And it's easy to see why imagine having to look at business records all day with only one good eye. At some point, his doctor told him he had to quit that job right away or lose all of his sight. Here's where Jack stood he had to choose. His job, which he had done for years, was no longer possible. He didn't have many choices because he only had one good eye. That might have been the end of the story, but it was only the start. Jack changed his mind and tried something completely different acting. And man, 
Did that work out for him? He may have thought his lazy eye was a flaw, but Hollywood thought it was great. It was 1949 when Jack Elam's first movie came out. It was called She Should Have Said No, There Wasn't Really a Big Deal About It. It was more of an exploitation movie meant to scare people. The story was about a girl in the chorus whose life falls apart because she smokes pot. Not only does her job fail, but her brother also ends up killing himself. Jack kept getting parts like this for the next 10 years, in gangster movies, westerns, and anything else where he could play the bad guy. He was really good at it, let's be honest. He stood out because of his rough look and crooked eye. Before the end of the 1950s, Jack was known as the most hated character on TV and in movies. That doesn't happen very often, but in Hollywood, it meant Jack was doing a good job. Jack was the guy to call when a movie needed a bad guy. People who watched TV in the 1950s and 1960s would have seen Jack in a lot of shows, especially westerns. He was a guest star on TV shows like Gunsmoke, Rawhide, The Lone Ranger, and Bonanza, and just about every other western show on TV at the time. People loved how Jack could make even the most ordinary bad guy seem like a superhero. He would sneer, swagger, and scowl better than most people, which kept him busy for years in the business. In 1961, Jack had one of the more unusual parts in an episode of The Twilight Zone. Calling all Mars fans, will the real Mars person please stand up? Jack played a slightly crazy bus rider. It wasn't a western or a crime movie, but it showed Jack could play more than just bad guys in cowboy boots. Then there was Lawman, a western TV show where Jack got to play Paul Henry in an episode called Clutie Hutter that was a little different for Jack. He still played a tough guy, but the story had a little more depth. Someone told him that his brother had died, but he wasn't sure if he should believe her. He didn't go after payback right away because he wasn't sure if she was involved. This made his usual bad guy part more interesting and showed that he could play more complex characters. Jack had a rare chance to play the good guy in 1963. He was cast as a gunfighter who changed his ways in the TV show The Dakotas. There were only 19 episodes of the show. But for Jack, it was a chance to break out of his bad guy role. Later that same year, he played a U.S. Marshal in Temple Houston, a different Western show. He was now George Taggart, a man who used to be a gunfighter but had changed his ways. Jack showed that he could be just as believable as a bad guy, even though he was used to playing bad guys. In 1966, Jack Elam did something very different from the bad guys he usually played. He was cast in the Western movie The Night of the Grizzly, which stars Clint Walker. It was big because Jack's first part was as a funny guy. He got to show that he wasn't always a bad guy. He could also make them laugh. The movie came out through Paramount Pictures and Joseph Pevney directed it. It was his last full-length movie. For a Western, the Night of the Grizzly story was pretty unique. Clint Walker played Marshal Big Jim Cole. He decides that being a police officer is too risky for him and his family, so they move to Wyoming to start over as ranchers. But, as you might expect from a Western, things aren't going as planned. As soon as they get settled, they start having all sorts of problems. A huge grizzly bear that kills people, angry neighbors, and a criminal from Big Jim's past who wants to get even. Even though Martha Hire and Keenan Win Win were in the movie, it was Jack Elam's acting as Hank that stood out. Hank was one of those funny figures who made us forget about how dangerous things were for Big Jim. Jack showed that he could be weird and funny while still having the crazy energy that he was known for. Being a good guy for a change was nice, and it helped people see him in a new way. Now, Clint Walker, who played the lead role, was one of those Hollywood stars who was too big for real life. He was known for having a deep voice and being, being very tall. Walker was well known from TV shows like Cheyenne, which made him the ideal choice to play the lead role in The Night of the Grizzly. Even though Clint was the strong, quiet hero and Jack was the strange comic relief, they worked well together. On set, the two stars became very close. Jack and Clint got along well. Not only were they tough guys who didn't put up with crap, but they were also funny. They didn't have the kind of Hollywood friendship you read about in the press, but they respected each other and got along well. But they were dating in real life as well as on screen. It was more than that. And as we'll see, it was a big deal in the years that followed, especially when Jack died and Clint bizarrely chose not to go to his wake. The Way West was Jack Elam's next Western part. It came out in 1967, not long after the Night of the Grizzly. He played Preacher Weatherby this time, a character who was a lot less serious and more funny than his regular bad guys. Among the stars he shared the screen with were Robert Mitchum, Richard Widmark, and Kirk Douglas. The movie was about a wagon train traveling the Oregon Trail. A funny part for Jack made the trip more interesting, and it proved that he could do more than just be the bad guy. Then, in 1968, Jack had a small but memorable part in Once Upon a Time in the West, Sergio Leone's famous spaghetti western. 
Jack's character was one of three gunslingers sent to kill Charles Bronson's character at a dusty train stop. If you saw it, you might remember him. In that scene, Jack spent most of his time trying to get rid of a bothersome fly. In the end, he managed to catch it in the barrel of his gun. That was a classic Jack Elam moment. He was funny without saying a word, and the scene still had a tense Western feel to it. After that, in 1969, Jack played another funny part in Support Your Local Sheriff, which also starred James Garner. The movie was a big hit, and Jack's role as a clumsy buddy made him bigger in the comedy world. He and James Garner worked together again on Support Your Local Gunfighter after two years. Jack wasn't just the bad guy anymore at this point. It worked, because he became someone people could turn to for humor. He stood out in both movies because of how tough he seemed and how funny he was. Both movies' director, Burt Kennedy, knew early on that Jack could be funny and hired him for 15 different jobs in the end. In the middle of the 1970s, he got a part in the TV show Texas Wheelers as Zack Wheeler, a long lost father who comes back to raise his children after their mother dies. The show wasn't very long, but it showed a kinder, more caring side of Jack that wasn't often seen on TV. By the late 1970s, Jack was still getting interesting parts. He played Dr. Frankenstein in Struck by Lightning, a show that only had three episodes, but he kept being funny with parts like Dr. Nicholas Van Helsing, a crazy proctologist in Cannonball Run and its follow-up, Cannonball Run 2. In 1986, Jack played the lead role in the movie The Aurora Encounter. It was there that he met Mickey Hayes, a young boy with proprioces. Because they were so close, a documentary was made about it. It showed a different side of Jack that wasn't just playing. He cared about the people he met along the way, and Mickey made an impact on him that would last. In his last few years in show business, Jack kept playing small parts, like in an episode of Home Improvement in 1992, but his health was getting worse. He was given the honor of being inducted into the Hall of Great Western Performers in Oklahoma City in 1994. It was the right way to honor a man who had done so much for Westerns over the course of his long career. As for Jack himself, he was married twice. Jean Louise Hodgert, his first wife, died in 1961 of colon cancer. In late that year, Jack married Margaret M. Jennison, and the two of them were together for more than 40 years. A man named Jack Elam died in Ashland, Oregon in 2003. He was 82 years old and had kidney failure. Even though he's dead, his legacy is one of Hollywood's most famous bad guys and later a comedic force goes on. Clint Walker, who had been friends with and worked with Jack Elam for a long time, was expected to attend his funeral. But when the day came, Clint Walker wasn't there, which made a lot of people wonder why. Clint didn't go to Jack's funeral because he was sick. At that point, Clint was in his mid-70s and having a lot of heart problems. He had had heart problems in the past, going back to a close call with death in 1971. Clint was snowboarding at Mammoth Mountain when he had an accident where he was hit by a ski pole. For a short time, his heart stopped beating. He was even said to be dead before he suddenly came back to life. However, what happened made Clint's heart weak, and he had to be very careful with it from then on. Clint's doctors told him to stay away from things that could make him feel or be physically stressed out. Funerals would have been very hard for him, especially for someone as close to him as Jack. Another risk was the trip that had to be made to get to the funeral. Clint had to follow a strict plan to take care of his heart problem. 